try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Alrighty. My name is Ken, and I'm the lead pastor here. And uh, growing up, I was the youngest of four boys, so I have three older brothers. Uh, and growing up in that situation, I don't know if you if you are similar as as I am, um, but growing up as the youngest of four boys, it means two things uh, marked my childhood. First thing is this: that I had to learn how to eat quickly. Okay, and here's why. Because if I didn't eat fast, there was no food left. Uh, so being the youngest of four boys, boys would consume a lot of food. And so I'm a fast eater. And so if, if, uh, if we have a meal together, you'll notice I'm a food ninja and I can consume food very quickly. That's because I grew up with three older brothers. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is this, that uh, we had a lot of wrestling matches. We had a lot of boxing matches. We had a lot of fights growing up. Being the youngest of four boys, a household of four boys, uh, we were a rowdy bunch. And so uh, we would put on our hockey helmets and hockey gloves and brawl it out. Or we, would, we had boxing gloves and, and we would box. Or we'd just old-fashioned wrestle. And, and, uh, and so there was one room in our house growing up. One room that was like the kids' playroom. Um, and for us, that was like the wrestling room, the fighting room. Uh, that's where we would box and all that stuff. And so growing up, uh, we, would, we would have our battles uh, in, in that room for the most part. And, uh, and so if it was a planned battle, that's where we were. Uh, if not, it, wherever we were was the wrestling match. But that room, uh, there was, the way the room was designed, uh, there was one wall that we would constantly either punch a hole through or throw someone through or push them through or, or body check them through or sumo plex them through. But there was one wall that we kept destroying. And so my dad would uh, get a piece of drywall and he would have to put the drywall screws in and then texture it and repaint and, and reset this wall. Well, that happened over and over again. And so what my dad would do is, is he wouldn't go through all that work anymore. He just had drywall like ready and set aside and he would just put that up and put the drywall screws in and then leave it like that. We wouldn't paint it. We wouldn't texture it. It would nothing. It was just like, okay, we've got a wall there, um, but it's, it didn't look, look good at all. It's because so frequently, me and my brothers were wrestling, throwing each other through those walls uh, growing up. And so I've been in a lot of fights uh, growing up with my brothers. And I'm embarrassed to say I've never won a fight in my life, okay? It's kind of embarrassing having three older brothers. I just have never won a fight in my life. But a lot of, a lot of wrestling and those things marked my childhood. And I, I don't know about you. Uh, maybe for you, that was... You and your siblings, you're like, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. For others, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, but we've all experienced dissension and fighting and quarrels in our lives. And some of them aren't as funny as, you know, siblings kind of growing up. Some of them are more serious. But even within your family, I'm sure there's some quarreling, there's some dissension, there's some fights along the way. And particularly like holidays come along, uh, you know, July 4th coming up and you get the barbecue going and you have some, some family come and there's always like that uncle or that aunt that shows up and you know they're going to say something and it's going to cause a fight and grandma's going to get upset and, 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 and there's quarreling and there's dissension in the midst of the family. We experience this in, in marriage, Right. Uh, regardless of how healthy and amazing your marriage might be, there's quarreling and dissension in every marriage and, and bickering and, and, and you get upset and there's fighting that happens and it's, it's a part of our families. Uh, we also see this with friends, right? Your friend group, that, that people that are like, hey, we're really close friends and then, oh, we kind of had a falling out and something happened and then we're upset with each other and there was a season where we, we weren't really talking or we weren't that close and you, you go through that as well with your friend group. We see this also with churches, and, and uh, at church, the, there's the worship wars, right? Maybe you've been a, a part of a church before, and it was like the, the, the older generation was like, it's all about the hymns, okay? God is all about the hymns. Jesus wrote all these hymns, and, and these are, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us, right? And so uh, it's all about the hymns, and it's got to be the organ, or it's got to be the piano, and like the drums and the guitar, like that's the devil, right? And so, and so there's these worship wars of like, it's got to be the hymns. That's got to be the hymns. And other people are like, no, no, no. It's got to be the, 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 the more contemporary music. And, 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 and you got to feel the bass in order to feel the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like these worship wars going on of like conflicting styles of, of worship. And churches literally uh, get uh, torn up because of this, because of these worship wars within the church. Or maybe it's, it's the translation of the Bible. So you might not know the, the Bible was written in Greek and in Hebrew. And so every English version we have is a translation of the scriptures. And so it's like, what, what translation should we use? And there's the translation uh, wars and battles, right? It's like, oh, you got to use the King James version of the Bible because if it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough for us, right? 
And it's like, no, 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 it was written in 1611. Like, Jesus didn't use the King James Version of the Bible. And so people are like, no, 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 it's got to be the King James Version of the Bible. And others, it's like, no, you've got to use the NIV. That's what we use. That's what we have under the, the seats there because it's readable. It's kind of uh, something that everyone can kind of grasp. Oh, no, it's got to be the ESV. It's got to be, you know, oh, the message, the message, you can't go there. You know, like all these battles on, like, what translation uh, that we should use and these, these battles that we have and dissension it causes between us. See, in, in all areas of our lives, whether it's our family, our friends, uh, school, work, there's, there's opportunity for quarreling, there's opportunity for fighting and battles and dissension that happens. And in the midst of all that, the question that we are going to explore together today is what causes these quarrels and fights? What is the source? What, what causes us to battle with one another? What causes dissension in our families? What causes conflict at work? What is the cause of these fights and quarrels? amongst us. And that's the question that James is going to tackle today in the scriptures. You see, we're in a series right now called The Walk. And in this series, we're going through the book of James. And James, he was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem during the the first century. And so he pastored this church. It became a large church. And James was no stranger to conflict. Pastoring a large church, he experienced conflict within his church. He also experienced conflict amongst the Christians uh, throughout the Roman Empire because uh, the church in Jerusalem was kind of like the mother church, the first church. That's where it all started. And so as problems came along in the early church, as we read in the book of Acts, the apostle Paul, him and Barnabas, they journey from a church in Antioch. They come to Jerusalem and James is the pastor then. They come to James and they bring together the church leaders to help decide what do we do with all these Gentiles who are becoming Christians? How do we handle the dissension and the problems that are going on? Like, do they need to get circumcised? Do they need to become Jewish? And they're trying to figure that out. And James is at the center of, of helping figure out this controversy and dealing with conflict. So James is no stranger to conflict. And James now writes to people who had attended his church but now have been, because of persecution, they're scattered throughout the Roman Empire and they're experiencing conflict. In their new churches, they're experiencing conflict in their new cities. And James writes to them, and he answers this question of what causes these conflicts? What causes this fighting and this quarreling among you? And so to see this, uh, what we're going to see is that this big idea that James is going to give us. And you can write this down. You've got a note page, hopefully, on your way in. There's some pens. It's this idea that the battles between us, the battles between us come from the battles within us. What James is going to show us that the battles between us, that the controversy between us, the conflict between us, it's the result of the battles that happen within us, the controversy within our own hearts. What James is going to say is that the battles, you know, we might say as you get in the midst of a conflict, what causes it? I would say him or her, right? Like you're in a, you're in a controversy with someone at work, a boss or whatnot, and you're like, they're the problem. What, what causes conflict? Them, right? What causes conflict? Him or her. And what James says is that the battles between us, where they start, where they begin, is the battles that's happening within us. And James invites us, and he's going to invite us today to look at what is the problem in my own heart that might be leading to this controversy? What is the problem in my own heart that is leading to this conflict? Now, let me just make a little caveat here. I don't think that James uh, is is saying in this that all conflict in your life is the result of a battle within you. But some of it is, and that's what we're going to tackle today. Some of the conflict that you might have can be godly conflict. Some of the conflict you have, might the other person might be the problem, him or her, or that group, or that thing. Um, they might be the issue. In fact, we see Jesus, he, he dealt with conflict, and Jesus was never at fault in it. Jesus was not sinful. He had conflict, and yet he was without sin. Jesus went in, and he overturned uh, the tables in the temple courts. And it wasn't because Jesus had a problem. It was because they were the problem, and Jesus was addressing it. So not all conflict means that you have a problem, you have an issue. But James says that much of our uh, conflict, much of our issues, much of the battles that happen between us, and James wants to address the fact that much of it is because of the battles that are happening in our own hearts. And so... We need to discern what's going on. And what I want us to focus on today is is the type of conflict uh, where, hey, maybe there's something going on with me that God wants to address in the midst of this. And so with that in mind, um, what we see is, uh, I love the way that one, uh, one counselor, he said this about conflict. He said, the heart of the problem is a problem with the heart. 
The heart of the problem, the heart of the issue uh, in the midst of conflict is a a problem with our hearts. And so I want us to be open this morning to God, what might, as we think about the conflict that you have in your life or the conflict that you're going to face, what might be the problem in my own heart, God, that you want to address through this? You see, as we deal with conflict, this is kind of cheesy, but you know when you're, you're, you're pointing the finger at someone, right? We always say that there's three fingers that are pointing back at yourself, Okay, so when you're pointing the finger, they're the problem. There's three fingers pointing back at yourself. And so what James is going to show us is three different potential problems that we might have in our own lives. And that's what we're going to see together today is here's three problems that we might have. Here's three battles that might be going on within us that God wants to address. And then we're going to see what God invites us in through James, what he says we should do about it. And so to see this, I invite you to once again open up the Bible, James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. James chapter 4 beginning in verse 1. It's on page four, or 848 in the Bibles underneath the seats. And we're going to walk through this passage together so you can keep your Bibles open for the, the remainder of this message. James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, says this, What causes fights and quarrels among you? There's the question that we're looking at. And James says, Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. If you're taking notes, the first problem that we see here that James addresses is our unsatisfied pleasures. Our unsatisfied pleasures. Our selfish desires. The word that he uses that, that's translated in your Bible either as desire or as pleasure, it's this word where uh, we get the English word hedonism. It's this idea of this, this desire for selfish pleasure. It's, it's this, this lust for, for just simple uh, satisfaction for me, myself, and I. And what James says is that at the heart of your controversy with someone else, at the, the heart of your conflict and your fighting with someone else, the problem is a problem of your unsatisfied pleasures and desires. That, that, that there's something that you want that you're not getting. There's something that you desire that you can't have. And so what do you do? You covet and you try to steal and kill and, get, and, and you'll do whatever it takes to try to get what you want for me, myself, and I. So at the heart of much of our conflict is your selfish, sinful desire for pleasure. You want something and you're not getting it. Now I see this uh, play out in my own life. Uh, I see this, that at times I'll get upset and, and I'm irritable. And my wife like, is like, what's going on with you, right? And, and I'm like, you're the problem, honey. Like, you're, you're, you're upsetting me or whatever, you know. And I'm getting all upset. And then I realize in the midst of it, no, it's, it, I'm upset about something that I wanted and I'm not getting. And now I'm upset and I'm, I'm causing a fight with my wife. And she's not the issue in it. She's not the problem in it. Uh, she's just the one I'm taking out on because I'm upset because I wanted something. I desire something. I'm not getting it. And now I'm taking it out on my wife. And I, and I start acting up like a 10-year-old girl who's not getting her way. And I'm, I'm emotional and whatnot. And the problem, I, I point the finger at my wife. But in reality, it's, it's I'm not getting what I want. And maybe you've been there in, in, in your own life. Uh, maybe uh, for you, it was at school. And at school, there's a person and that you're like, I don't like this person, right? Like, I have anger towards them. I don't like this person. And, and I ask, well, why? Why don't you like this person? You're like, because they're the person that sits in the front row at school, and they always raise their hand, and they always have the answer, and they turn their, their, their paper in first, and they're like the teacher's pet, and they're just so annoying, and I don't like them, and I get angry at them. And, and, and you're like, yeah, they're the problem in my class, right? I just don't like that person. I have an issue with that person. And what I would ask is, is, is it a problem with the person or are you upset with them because uh, you're not getting something that you want, which is you want the attention from the presser or you wish you were turning your paper in first. See, sometimes the conflict with others is really a problem with our own hearts and our own desire to get something. Or maybe it was with your spouse. Okay, you, I'm, I'm going to speak to the husbands for a moment. Uh, your, your wife wants you to watch the kids on Saturday morning. And uh, so that she can go and have brunch with some of her friends or with her family. And you're like, this is unfair. Like, this is, 
you know, this is just unjust that, that I have to watch the kids on Saturday morning. And like, I can't believe she's so selfish. She's so selfish. And yet the reality is she normally watches the kids and, and takes the brunt of that. And, uh, and you're just upset because you're planning on going golfing, right? And now you can't go golfing and you're not, you're not getting your desire met to go golfing that morning. Can I get an amen? <laughs> you see, sometimes the conflict in our lives is because of a desire that's not being met. A, a, a selfish desire of I want me, myself, and I. Or maybe it's you with your parents. You're like, my parents are so controlling. Uh, my parents have all these rules and curfew. And like, I'm an adult, but I still live at home. And they're trying to, to, to have all these rules on me. And, and they are so controlling. Like the problem is them. My parents have issues, right? <laughs> I got an amen here and a nudge from mom. <laughs> We're causing fights this morning, people. (laughs) But what if the problem, rather, is your own desire for, hey, I want to be in control. I think I know what's best. I want to be king or queen of my own life. You see, oftentimes, it's our unsatisfied pleasures, our own sinful desires that lead to conflict with others. That's the first problem that we see here is that our unsatisfied pleasures are not being met. And then James goes on and he gives us a second issue, which is this. Our, it has to do with a, a prayer. It has to do with prayer. And we see this in verse 2 uh, as we continue on in the passage. In verse 2 it says this, You do not have, okay, you do not have, so you start fighting and quarreling because you don't have, you're not getting what you want. You do not have, why? Because you do not ask God. You do not have because you do not ask God. In verse 3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures or your desires. That same word shows up there again. And what we see here is, if you're taking notes, is that our second problem is our unasked and our unanswered prayers. Second problem is our unasked and unanswered prayers. James goes on to say, you don't have because you don't ask. You don't go to God in prayer. And what he's getting at is you've given up on going to God, your heavenly father, who's the giver of all good gifts. You've quit going to him and trusting him that he's going to be good to you. You've quit going to him as the source of your joy. You've quit going to him to be the one who's going to satisfy your heart's desires. You quit asking. You quit going to God in prayer. You quit looking to him to give you what you truly, des- to, uh, what you truly need and the gifts that you desire. You've quit trusting in God's goodness. You've quit praying and asking God. And so you go and you try to look other places. You've got to try to figure it out on your own. You, got, you try to look in other ways to find that satisfaction and that joy. So he says, your unasked prayers are part of the problem. And then he goes on to say, if you even do pray, you, God doesn't answer those. They go unanswered because you're asking with the wrong motives, the wrong heart, the wrong, uh, the wrong reasons. And and that's why your, your prayers are unanswered. And so it's like the person who is uh, working at a restaurant, and they're like, God, would you please get me some big tips, get me some big money this, this Thursday night? Why? So that on Friday night, I can spend it at the bar, right? And God's like, no, I'm not going to answer that prayer. <laughs> he says, yeah, you're praying, but you're asking for the wrong things and with the wrong heart, the wrong motives. And so your prayers go unanswered. Another caveat here. What James is not saying is that all of your unanswered prayers are a result of wrong motives. James is not saying that, that as you pray for grandpa to get healed and grandpa doesn't get healed, well, the problem is you had the wrong motives. That is not what James is saying. Some prayer goes unanswered and the reasons are different. And we're like, God, I don't understand why you're not answering. This is good. This is in line with your will. This is what the scriptures say you desire and you want. And God, we, we, we don't understand why you're doing this. Maybe it's you're praying for pregnancy and you, you want to have a baby and it, the prayer is going unanswered. It might not be because your motives are wrong. You're like, we have good motives in this. You see, not all unanswered prayer falls into this category. And so don't think that God isn't answering your prayer simply because you have wrong motives. But there are some prayers that we pray that are with the wrong heart, selfish motives, selfish reasons. And James says that some of our prayers go unanswered because we're asking for the wrong things with the wrong heart, with the wrong motives. James says the problem, one of our problems is these unasked things. We don't go to God. We don't trust him for, for it, it, that he's going to be good to us, that he's going to give us these things. 
Or we go to him and we're just asking for the wrong things with the wrong heart, with the wrong motives. So problem number two is their unasked and unanswered prayers. And then James goes on and he gives us the third problem, which we see through verse four, uh, beginning in verse four. It says this, you adulterous people. That's some strong language there, James. You adulterous people, you people who commit adultery. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God against God? Therefore, anyone chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. What James is saying here, and you can write this down, is that our third problem is that we flirt with the world and cheat on God. James calls us adulterers. And what he's saying is, you flirt with the world and you cheat on God. You see, our relationship with God, our relationship with God, is, as God invites us into an intimate relationship with Him through Jesus Christ, that relationship is not simply a king with uh, His servants. This, this king is in a distant castle and he's just sending His orders uh, to His servants. That relationship is not simply a master to His slaves. But the Bible describes this relationship that we have through Jesus Christ, this relationship that we have with God, of a husband with his bride, of a husband with his wife, of this spousal intimate relationship. And so when someone becomes a believer, when you become a believer, you become the bride of Christ. You have this intimate relationship with him of husband and wife. Now think about it at a wedding at a wedding, the husband and the bride, they, they, they say to one another that I'm going to be fully committed to you. I'm going to be fully devoted to you until death do us part. All of my, my, my devotion is going to be aimed towards you and not towards any other human being. And the same thing with God is that God desires our devotion, our love, our heart. And he's not willing to share us with others. God's not willing to share us with any other so-called God. And what James is getting at is as we've given up going to God and trusting him and his goodness, as we desire to, to fulfill these sinful desires and these pleasures, and we go, I'm, I'm not getting what I want. And so we go away from God, we, and we, we go and look for this other places. He, James is saying it's like a, hus- a wife running from her husband and running off to other boyfriends. And James is saying you run off to the world to try to find this love in other things. And now, the word the world, uh, we use this in, through scripture. There's three different meanings of the world. Okay, so the first use of the world, because this can kind of get confusing. If, if you know our, our, our mission statement as a church, it's that we want to develop authentic followers of Jesus Christ who love God, one another, and the world. Okay, and then in another place in scripture, it says, uh, do not love the world or anything in the world. And you're like, okay, I thought, what? What's going on here? Je- Jesus said, uh, in John 3.16, actually, it says that, that Jesus came and he, the, one, the son came. Why? So, because of his love for the world. God gave his one and only son. So we're supposed to love the world. We're not supposed to love the world. What's he talking about? The word world throughout scripture is used for three different things. The first of all, it's used to talk about people. All people, okay? And that's the sense that we use it in terms of loving the world, is that we want uh, to bring the good news to all the people in the world. So the first sense is, is the people of the world, the humans that God has created. The second sense is the planet, the universe. And so you see that throughout scripture, uh, the sense of world, and we use the, the word in the same way as well. And then the third way, and this is the most unique way, is that, and this is a negative sense, it's these systems in the world, these systems of evil and sin, that are marked by selfishness and the ways of the enemy. And that is what James is opposing. And that's what we see throughout scripture. Do not love the world or anything in the world. Do not, do not love these selfish, sinful ways. And what James is saying is that we flirt with the world. And we go to the world's ways and, and the world's ways of finding joy and satisfaction. And we abandon God, our first love. We run away from our husband, and we run into the arms of the world. 
And so James is saying, our problem is that we've, we've run away from our first love. Instead of simply fighting the symptoms, James is saying we need to, to deal with the problem. And the problem is that we've cheated on God. The problem is we've cheated on God. And so we see that the battles between us, the controversy that, that happens between us, starts with the battles within us. This desire for something that we're not getting. And so we don't go to God. We don't ask him. Uh, if we do ask, we ask with the wrong heart and we're asking for the wrong things. And so we run away from God and we run to the world and to sinful things to try to satisfy our heart and our desires. And in the midst of that, we cause fights and quarrels amongst us. And so James is saying, if you want to deal with the problem, don't just deal with the symptoms. Don't just deal with the fighting that's going on and the quarreling or whatever conflict you might have. Deal with the heart issues and the problems behind it. And so what do we do? What's the cure? What we see Verse 7 through 10 is this, you can write this down, is to humbly repent before God. Humbly repent before God. Beginning of verse 7, he says this, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. He uses a bunch of verbs here, a bunch of commands to tell us to humbly repent before God. He begins by saying, submit to God. Surrender yourself before God. In humility, submit to God and say, God, I want you to be Lord of my life. I want to surrender my heart and my life to you. That's what he means by submit, this idea of surrender. And then he goes on to say, resist the devil. Resist Satan. That in the midst of your humility before God, stand boldly before the enemy. Now, I want to speak to the married couples for a moment. Uh, There was a a woman who was married for 40 years, and she was asked by a newlywed couple. They were on their honeymoon, and uh, and the the newlywed couple asked, you've been married 40 years. Can you give us some advice? And so this lady said, okay, yeah, here's my advice for you. After 40 years of marriage, here's what I want to tell you, is that you two are family now. She said, you're family. This is your family. You are family and you are not enemies, she said. And she told them, I want you to look at one another and say, you are my family now. And so they looked at each other, you're my family now. She said, you are not my enemy. You are not my enemy. She said, but you do have an enemy. And you need to recognize that in the midst of conflict and throughout the years, that you do have an enemy, but it's not your spouse. And you do have an enemy. And we need that reminder for our marriages. We need that reminder for our families and for our friends. We need that reminder for our church family, that we have an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but we are not the enemy. Your spouse is not the enemy. Your boss is not the enemy. Your neighbor is not the enemy. Your aunt or uncle is not the enemy, that we have an enemy, that we have an enemy, but may we remember that we, want, that we are family, that we are not the enemy. And so he says, resist, resist the enemy, resist the devil, recognize that we have a spiritual war going on. Humbly, humbly submit to God, but stand strong against the enemy. And then he goes on to to explain all these different ways of us repenting and asking God to purify us and wash us clean and, and changing our thoughts and changing our lives and this transformation, which is really about repentance, And the idea of repentance is of of changing your mind and changing your way and turning from one thing and turning to another. It's turning away from our sin and our selfishness and our sinful desires and turning to God. And finally asking and saying, God, I'm sorry for my sinfulness, God. Lord, would you change me and transform me? God, would you be the joy and the love of my life? And the last verse in verse 10 tells us this. If we humbly repent, if we humble ourselves before the Lord, Promises that he will lift you up. You see, the only way up is down. The only way up is down. For for us, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord and to humbly repent. And God will lift us up. Now, in a moment, what we're going to do together as we respond uh, is we're going to celebrate communion. You'll see on each side, uh, there's some bread and there's a cup. Now, with the cup, what I want you to do is to dip, not sip, okay? Okay. So take a piece of bread and dip it in there. 
And what this represents is Christ's blood shed for you and his body broken for you. And in this, what we see is that Jesus Christ, that he provides for you and me a way for us to have peace with God. Because apart from Jesus, we're enemies with him. As we run to the world and run away from God, that we are (laughs) uh, enemies with him. We're at enmity with him. But through Jesus Christ, peace is made possible with God. And through Jesus Christ, peace is made possible in our relationships with one another. You see, what causes fighting and quarreling among us? The problem is the battles within us, our own selfish desires, the fact that we've run away from God. And so may we be people who run to him this morning. May we be people who find peace with God, and through that, may we lead in peace with one another. Would you pray with me this morning?